CityWorks Expo is a collaborative, co-creative, and multidisciplinary idea exchange and festival conference that happens each fall in Roanoke, Virginia. By day, attendees are immersed in thought-provoking presentations, riveting performances, and engaging dialogue. By night, the conference continues with after-hours networking opportunities during street festivals, parties, and musical events. To learn more about Expo, visit cityworksexpo.com. Expo 2014 was made possible by these fine sponsors. So three years ago, I gave an Expo talk called Get Out of Your Zip Code. It was about crossing geographic borders and psychological boundaries, about seeing the strange and the familiar and the familiar and the strange. And I urged all of you to get out of your comfort zones and to develop a spidey sense about what moves you and then that should be your thing and your calling. And I talked about making friends before you need them and then collaborating with those people. So today I'm gonna to tell you a story kind of about that with pictures that's also about Factory Man. It's a story about globalization that has a little bit of memoir, uh, social history, contemporary business reporting sort of braided together. Or as my agent put it when he read the book proposal, holy shit, Macy, you found Moneyball with furniture. <laughs> so back to exponential ed, um, so this is a story that would not have been possible without the kind of collaborations that are being forged here this weekend. Um, it's about, I had this nascent idea to write a book and I voiced it out loud on my friend Chris and Connie's Henson's front porch. At the same time, their neighbors, Leslie and Keno Snyder, were thinking about maybe opening a craft brewery called Parkway in Salem. Does that ring a bell with anybody? And Leslie, in that awesome, raspy voice of hers, says, Macy, we could even do a beer for your book. So, so I want to talk today about what happens when ideas and creativity aren't stomped in the fetus stage, but rather brain, brainstormed and woodshopped and allowed to grow because, you know, so what else if, if, so what if nobody else has written a book quite like this before? or started a business quite like that before, or gotten 300 strangers together in a room before like this. Um, it's about friends like Ed Walker, who very strategically purchased something like, I don't know, 500 copies of Factory Man. <laughs> the first week it came out with the express purpose of giving them to you. So I saw him recently in his office on Kirk Ave, and I was like, is that my book? And. Uh, I was like, oh my God. He, he said, I don't think I'm responsible for your debut at number 10 on the bestseller list. <laughs> he goes, but I might have gotten you from 11 to 10. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. <laughs> so today, um, more seriously, I'm going to talk about why I framed the book the way I did around the voiceless millions who lost their jobs to offshoring. And it begins with the story of this ragamuffin. So I grew up poor, uh, the daughter of a factory worker mom who soldered airplane lights in a factory town um, in Ohio. And when the economy was good, she worked, and when it wasn't, she usually babysat. I was the first in my family to go to college, and I did it thanks to full financial aid, few scholarships. Um, I'm not sure that leap would have been possible had she been born 15 years later, and I'm pretty sure it wouldn't be possible at all today. Which explains why I'm not your typical business writer. I will interview the CEOs, and I will talk to the economists and the politicians, but I start with the people on the ground. Because in my marrow, I don't think the CEO is more important than the guy sweeping the floor. And sorry, Supreme Court, I really don't think corporations are people. <laughs> so one of my favorite quotes about journalism, when I used to teach at Hollands, I would put this on my syllabus every time. It's a, from a historian named Will Durant. Civilization is a stream with banks. The stream is sometimes filled with blood from people killing, stealing, shouting, and doing the things historians usually record while on the banks, unnoticed, people build homes, make love, raise children, sing songs, write poetry, and even whittle statues. The story of civilization is the story of what happened on the banks. So Factory Man just happens to be set, most of it, along the banks of the Smith River 
in Henry County, Virginia, which is about an hour south of here. Here's how it came about, and talk about collaboration. Um, for years I had watched my newsroom colleagues who are business reporters cover all these factory closings in Martinsville and Henry County. But in 2010, a photographer friend and neighbor of mine named Jared Soares uh, took it upon himself as a freelancer to start, start documenting what that looked like. What's it look like when one community loses 20,000 jobs? That's half of its workforce. What's it look like when you have the highest rate of unemployment in the state for more than a decade? What happens to a community when the jobs go away? You, you bump into people like Samuel Watkins. He'd been, he'd been among the last furniture workers laid off in 2012 in Martinsville. When I met him in 13, the AP had just announced new data showing that four in five American adults will face poverty sometime in their lives. A month earlier, an MIT economist named David Otter released a study documenting the skyrocketing rates of disability and wage deflation in trade-impacted areas like Martinsville and Henry County. So finally, Samuel has some numbers to back up his story like he needed it. He was 61, gardening. He was making $8.50 an hour, carrying his tools around in the back of a beat-up Ford Explorer. His wife was another laid-off furniture worker, and she had just applied for federal disability. Sam had just maxed out his credit card when I met him to have an infected tooth pulled. The world was now flat, yes, and we could all get our blue jeans and bedroom suits a little cheaper thanks to it, but millions of working Americans had been flattened in the process. To find that story in the media, though, you had to read it between the lines of the monthly jobs reports, the page three crime briefs, the wire stories about Bangladeshi garment fires. In 2011, police arrested a 34-year-old man for setting fire to an abandoned Bassett furniture factory. He'd been trying to salvage the copper electrical casings to resell on the black market, but started a fire instead. Desperate and unemployed, he'd shown up to the scene of his crime on a bicycle. He left in the back of a police car with burns on his face. When news of the fire spread across the county, displaced workers converged to watch their old workplace burn. One told me it was like going to a funeral for everyone you knew. Most of the displaced were scraping by, many of them working part-time if they were employed at all. And the numbers yesterday on the jobs report showed, um, I think we have 7.1 million people in this country working part-time who would like to be working full-time. And uh, before the recession, that number was much lower, 4.6 million. This is Mary Red, a former textile mill office worker who now works 30 hours a week uh, as a receptionist with no benefits. When I met her, she was picking up catering jobs on the side, um, helping a friend serve food at parties, and she had run into her old CEO from Tultex at one of these parties, and she said to him, when she told me what she said to him, it really made me gasp. She said, if Tultex were to open up back up today, and the only way I could get there would be to crawl on my belly like a snake, I would do it. That's Frances Kizzy. Uh, she's on the right. She'd lost six jobs and 18 years to closings. First textiles, then furniture, then a call center called StarTech, which ultimately was relocated to the Philippines. To make ends meet, Frances was taken in borders and going back to school with the help of Trade Adjustment Assistance, or TAA. She was in her mid-50s when we met, working toward a certificate in childcare, which she felt could not be offshored. She was also baking cakes. Her sister would take them at, to her sister's workplace in little baggies and sell them by the slice during lunch to the other workers. TAA um, is the government's response. It's supposed to be like, okay, well, this thing has happened to you through no fault of your own. You've lost your job. We give you TAA. And it pays for you to be retrained. And um, the problem is it's just... Uh, it, it hasn't been updated in way too long, and only about a third of the displaced workers even go back for retraining for a variety of reasons that I'm happy to talk about later. Um, 
I found it to be really out of touch, impotent. It was designed in the 60s, and I would argue that it needs a total overhaul. It's like um, they've never talked to a displaced worker. The day Jared and I went there, this day, there was a film strip. They played, well, I guess it wasn't a film strip. It was like a film strip from the 70s, and it was showing, it was a video, a scratchy recording on the wall, but the sun had moved in the afternoon, and they couldn't even see what was on the wall. And uh, Jared and I just kept looking at each other, really? This is Nick Lane Nunley. He worked for 18 years at Hooker Furniture in Martinsville as a sample man. And that's the person that takes the drawings the engineer um, makes for the furniture, and he actually builds them and, and says, you know, well, this should be actually this number of inches. He, he's, the, he's the prototype builder. It's very high skilled. When Hooker closed in 2007 and started importing from China, Vietnam, and Indonesia, um, Lane took TAA and became a certified auto body mechanic uh, in Stoneville, North Carolina. He went from making 18 hours, $18 an hour with full benefits and profit sharing to $9 an hour now with no benefits. When he gets sick, he told me, I write it out and use home remedies. A lot of people were, were um, making the rounds of the area food pantries after their food stamps would run out around the 15th or the 20th of the month. The director of this pantry told me it was possible to divine what people used to do for work by their disfigurements. The women who'd been over sewing machines uh, making sweatshirts had humps on their back. The men who'd called wood for the furniture factories, uh, some of them were missing fingers. He said, quote, we're the last, last, last resort to stand in line for a box of old food. That, by the way, is um, a textile, that's an old textile mill conveyor belt converted for a food distribution, which I thought was pretty ironic. People were growing their own food, raising chickens, cobbling together a patchwork of under the table jobs. This is Janet Pullen, um, who was a sharecropper until the late 50s, early 60s. Then she was a furniture worker. Then she was unemployed. Her, well, her parents were sharecroppers as well. She was, I met her when she was getting uh, one of those boxes of old food at the pantry, and she was telling me about her parents, Mabel and Charles, who were 96 and 98. And um, they share this salad patch, as they call it, between their two houses uh, in the yard. I saw Mabel last week. Um, she just turned 98 last week. And... Uh, She's doing great. Charles passed away around last Christmas, but this picture was um, from about a year ago. And um, Janet says of her mother, nobody on earth has worked as hard as my mama. So after, our, this was actually not for my book. It was, I'm, they're a source in my next book, but um, it, it was totally fit everything I had heard and underscored everything I had learned um, from the research on my book. And um, I met them for a story I was doing on, um, food stamps, and um, they, you all probably remember they were reduced about a year ago. And when my story ran in the Roanoke Times, a very generous reader sent a very generous check. And when I, so I drove it out on Saturday because I didn't want to mail it. I mean, it was a really special check. <laughs> I wanted to see it. And um, they were just getting ready for Thanksgiving. She had just made this Thanksgiving ingredient list of what, what she wanted, but they had no money and they had no idea how they were going to buy their turkey and fixings. And when she saw the check, I'm not sure she'd ever seen a check that big, she started crying and she said, God bless you, a double potion. <laughs> so that's Wanda Purdue. Um, among the most ironic of my interviewees were scores of displaced workers in their 50s and early 60s I'd interviewed who'd done everything asked of them, including the TAA, and, um, you know, she got a 3.3 in her uh, associate's degree program at Patrick Henry Community College. She still had only managed to land a part-time job at Walmart, the retailer that had done more to champion offshoring than any other company in the world. So she was 58 when I met her, laid off when Stanley Furniture closed in 2010, and her one splurge, she only bought, like, generic stuff, but her one splurge when she went to the grocery was she would buy Lux brand Pinto beans. She's the person who asked me, she was really curious, the jobs had initially gone from China to Vietnam and now 
chasing cheaper labor. They were in Indonesia, and she, said, she asked me to go there and come back and tell her why it is we can't make it here anymore. And that really became a driving question of my book. And I did go to Indonesia, and I did meet those workers. Um, was there another way, though? Was, did it have to be the way it was? And hadn't anyone at all fought back to keep their workers employed? It turned out someone had, from the tiny hamlet of Galax, Virginia, John Bassett III had taken on China at the U.S. International Trade Commission. In 2003, he filed from Galax, Virginia, the largest anti-dumping petition in the world against China. He was feisty and Faulknerian. And from a strictly storytelling perspective, this factory man seemed to have all the elements to make a compelling book, not to mention an HBO miniseries. So here was a 75-year-old multimillionaire who genuinely seemed to care about the generations of workers who'd made his family rich. And he said things you don't normally hear out of the mouths of CEOs, like, the fucking chai comms aren't going to tell me how to make furniture. <laughs> who says that? <laughs> and I really liked the idea of writing, using him as a main character because his story had historical sweep. He'd been born in the eponymous company town of Bassett, Virginia, and you could tell the whole history of the furniture industry through his family. So this is the plant you saw earlier in that burning picture. It was the first plant John ever ran uh, after he got out of college. One of his first memories as a child is um, his father would uh, drive him to Little League games on Saturdays, and on the way there, they'd stop by the factories to check on things. And one of his first memories is getting lost in the whir of routers, because they used to work overtime on Saturday mornings, and crying, because he couldn't find his dad, and the chauffeur happened to be uh, dispatched to take him back home to his house on the hill. So his grandfather, started the whole thing. His name was J.D. Bassett, a.k.a. Mr. J.D. And um, he started an industry, really. Uh, first one factory and then seated several others, Hooker, Vaughn, Vaughn Bassett, Stanley. They all were started with his help by his relatives. And, but this was the first one. He built it basically in his front yard in 1902 using free timber from his property and cheap labor which were subsistence farmers and former sharecroppers eager to join the cash economy. He used the Smith River, which you can't see, but it's, it's in the foreground by the trees, um, which is uh, to move the logs from the, his sawmill to the factory and later to harness the steam for the boilers. They built a town eventually so people wouldn't have to walk in from the mountains in the pre-dawn. They used to carry lanterns as they walked in. As the first southern furniture maker to hire Sorry. I think I missed a picture. Oh, there's a slide missing. Oh, well. I'll just tell you what I was going to show you. I had a really wonderful picture of the Stanley, um, or they called it the rub room. It's where they did the finishing. Um, he was the, fr he was, you could say he was progressive because he was the first Southern furniture maker to hire African Americans at a height of Jim Crow, but he was also wily and shrewd because he paid them half of what the, he paid the white workers, and he gave them the worst jobs. Bassett was a definition of paternalism. Black workers lived in shacks along a snaky hollow road that flooded every time it rained. White workers lived in company houses closer to the factories, and everyone paid their light bills at the company headquarters. The police, the cab driver, the street sweeper, street lights, the town doctor, it was all owned and operated by Bassett Furniture Industries. But paternalism could sometimes be kind, such as when Bassett Furniture weathered the depression without laying a single person off something you don't hear much about today. According to the little girl in this picture, now in her 80s, JD, Mr. JD went around to every worker, surveyed the number of mouths each man had to feed, and cut his hours accordingly. Everybody took, everybody took a little bit of a hit, but nobody lost their job. That was the upward mobility trajectory before globalization. Betty's grandparents had been sharecroppers, her father a furniture worker, and Betty herself had ended up with a master's degree in a career in social work. 
She remembers money being so tight during the Depression that her mom couldn't afford pencils and paper, and so she learned how to make her letters by drawing on the condensation in the windows. Bassett Furniture modernized during World War II and positioned itself to become what was the largest furniture making operation in the world. The GIs came home, the American suburbs were booming, and people needed furniture to put in the bedrooms of their new ranch homes. And there was drama galore, glorious, juicy drama, as there usually is in a family run business with millions on the line. Little John, that's him on the right, that's the whole town called him, still call him Little John, he's 77 now. He could not get along with his tempestuous older brother-in-law, Bob Spillman, and that's him second on the left. And um, Spillman beat him to the CEO job he'd been born to inherit and by all accounts made his life really, really hard at Bassett Furniture. So in 1983, John finally quit Bassett and he decamped to Galax where he resurrected a struggling Bond Bassett Furniture, which had been founded by John's grandfather and his wife Pat's grandfather in 1919. And the only person who raised her voice about it or made any fuss at all was Gracie Wade, the family maid. A Bassett quitting Bassett? She muttered as she served the Spillman's Christmas dinner. It ain't right. Like his grandfather, JB3 was wily. He was shrewd. He'd arrived in Galax with a dresser-sized chip on his shoulder and an insufferable competitive drive. As more than one of his competitors um, barked at me when they heard I was writing a book using him as the main character. Why do you want to write about him? He's an asshole. <laughs> he, John later wanted to know. He goes, well, who called me an asshole? I said, like, give me some minutes. It's gonna, I got to write a list. So. <laughs> In the late 90s and early aughts, when Chinese furniture makers started flooding the market with imports that were so cheap, he knew that they had to be dumping which means illegally underpricing the furniture, usually at, for even less than it cost the materials to make it with, he had the audacity to fight back. He'd already had his line workers deconstruct a $100 dresser that was coming in from Dalian, China, which is in northern China, and he'd priced out all the parts, so he really thought he had the evidence that they were dumping, which is illegal according to the WTO. He'd already journeyed undercover to remote Dalian with his MBA, MBA son Wyatt, that's, that's why it up front in the khakis. Um, and a friendly translator from Taiwan who harbored no love for the mainland Chinese. And that's her third from the left, Rose. The three of them posed as American furniture makers on a buying trip while they went from factory to factory trying to find the source of that cheap chest of drawers. Again, all from Galax, Virginia. <laughs> Is that a story? I just... You'll have to read the book to learn how they pulled it off, and luckily you have one in your bag. Um, they spent a lot of money on lawyers in Washington, but know this, it took a certified asshole with millions in the bank and a dresser-sized chip on his shoulder to prove the Chinese were cheating. As John likes to say, quoting General Patton, when in doubt, attack. So meanwhile, back in Bassett, a thriving boom town that once looked like this, and literally they say on Saturday mornings, um, when everybody was out shopping, it would take you like 15 minutes to walk one block because there'd be so many people. It now looks like this, where you, you never see a person walking on the sidewalk. One by one, the seven plants in Bassett, the factory town closed, leaving, making it a town with no factories. And across the country, because they had a lot of other plants, they ended up putting 8,500 people out of work. Elegant homes that, well, there's my rub room picture from earlier. I don't know why it's there. <laughs> Elegant homes that had once um, been occupied by the company founders and used to look like this. That's Gracie Wade, by the way, the one who complained when little John left town. That's her second from the left. Um, now look like this. And um, the lady who owns it now said she can't afford to heat it in the winter. The population of Bassett's about a third its former size, and more than half of the people in the, in the uh, county drive to North Carolina and other places outside of the county to work. 
the town barber, a great source, he, um, <laughs> he, opens, he has to open a shop at 5 a.m. every day in order to serve the many people that have to drive outside uh, of, the, of the county to work. And volunteers now pool their resources. M most of them, like the middle manager retirees that got out before the factories are closed, would be sort of, you know, the wealthy people in Bassett now, and they pool their resources to pay the money for the street lights. Um, because the company doesn't pay that anymore. Over in Galax, John Bassett had won his anti-dumping case and not without copious amounts of more drama in his family, in his industry, even in the courts. Still going on, by the way. Um, he not only kept his factory going, he opened up an abandoned plant next door, saving 700 jobs, and many have argued, it's really saving the town. And that was how my book was supposed to end. That's what I wrote on my book proposal, my holy shit, it's money bought with furniture. Um, I said it would end with this kind of triumphant moment. Uh, he's on the conveyor belt, all the workers behind him, politicians in the front row. It was a great scene. I was there to witness it, which always helps. And, um, but before he went on, he looked at me over sawdust-covered saw glasses, and he said, well when you never went cheap with the other woman down the street, meaning China, you don't have to come drag ass and back. <laughs> so, so he'd stayed, and now that the recession is all, was almost over, he's like poised to grow, and he's going to expand because he never left to begin with. So I was going to end with that. But one day, I, re I re got really attached to Bassett and those people in Bassett, and one day driving home from a reporting trip, the takeaway hit me like a, like a, a ton of bricks. Um, and the takeaway I felt was this, that no one was minding the back room of the new global store. When China joined the WTO in 2001, politicians um, promised Americans it would be a win-win, that our workers would not lose jobs, they actually said that, um, that we would simply export more goods to a um, growing Chinese middle class, but few people had, you know, noticed that it didn't turn out the way they said. So we can all get our blue jeans a little bit cheaper now, but few people in Washington have paid attention to the creeping small-town carnage created by acronyms like NAFTA and WTO and an impotent TAA, all of it forged by faraway people who never really bothered to see the full result of what globalization had wrought. And, and, and that, to me, was really the heart of Factory Man. So I watched factories go like that to that over the course of two years. To that, another one burned down, that one's Bassett Superior Lines. That's after they burned it, they had to cart it all away, all the detritus. And that's, um, that's this isn't the right plant, but it's, it's the right idea because they, what, the, what they replace them with ultimately is um, gra they plant grass and level it and they put a fence up in front of it and you're not supposed to go in there. So that's, but that's actually Old Town, which had been the site of the front yard where he built the first factory, Mr. J.D. And then um, finally to the last scene in my book, which, um, which I felt was the heart of the story and deserved to be the last word. So this is Harry Ferguson. He's the demo guy. The company paid him to haul off um, hundreds of tons of what remained of the last factory in the former factory town of Bassett. At the end of our interview, he pointed to a neat stack of bricks he'd set over in the corner, and I asked him what they were, and he said they're for people that come by to get like a commemorative brick. And so I was thinking about that and um, how they were, they were for nostalgia, sure, but, but they weren't just for that, they were also proof that unfettered free trade had not been a win-win for everyone, and that while the CEOs were cashing bigger checks and the Walmart heirs were accruing wealth equal to that of the bottom 41.5% of American families, the American job market had hollowed out. That's the story of what happened on the riverbanks. So, this part always chokes me up. It's okay, don't worry, I'm fine. But maybe, I won't, maybe since I said that, I won't get choked up. So the last scene of the book is Harry giving me one of the bricks. He picks one of the bricks out from his stacks and he chinks it off the mortar before he passes it gently to me the way m one might hand over a sleeping baby. And the brick was warm, it was May, 
and it was solid, and when he looked me in the eye, neither of us said a word, but we both knew that there were people out there who would crawl on their bellies like a snake if it meant they could have it all back. So thank you. <laughs>